1 Kings 17, we're going to look at uh, the life of Elijah, and um, we're going to, Lord willing, cover the, the whole chapter, and I know that Mark has got a trip to the varsity afterwards, so he wants me to preach quickly. There is the smell of onion rings. Can y'all hear? <laughs> Amen. Now, for some of y'all, I just lost you for the rest of the message right now. But let's see what God has to say. I am, um, how many of y'all are big fans of Elijah? Well, let me introduce you to Elijah for those that uh, you're not a fan of him yet. On the Mount of Transfiguration, when Jesus needs someone to come minister to him, and the turning point of his ministry when he, at the, at the beginning of his ministry, had large crowds and people would come to him. But at the, there was a, a midpoint, really about two-thirds of the way through his ministry, when it was um, like saying, okay, this is the bell lap, and, and everything's going to be pointing to the cross. And <clears throat> ministry changed. It really became hard, very hard. It had never been easy, but uh, all of hell came against him and what he was seeking to do for my salvation and for your salvation. And at that time, G Jesus went up on the mountain, uh, took the glory back upon him that he laid down before he came to earth, and there was ministered to by Moses and by Elijah. Some say the two greatest prophets in the Old Testament. One who represented the law, Moses, one who represented the, the rest of the prophets. But this was a man who, who came out of obscurity. He was uh, a Tishbite, uh, a small, small little place, just, uh, uh, really just a group of, uh, of a family or two or three that were there. But they were known. They were mountainous people. But he came to, uh, to listen to the Lord, to follow the Lord, and had the boldness and courage <coughs> Excuse me. That as God so um, led him to, he would go straight to the king and to tell the king, pronounce to the king, that in the next years that are ahead, it would not rain except at his word. And then in verse 2, it says, Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Get away from here, turn eastward, and listen to this word, and hide by the brook Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. The very first thing that we understand of Elijah, we as a calling up of God on his, on his life, and he went skyrocketing all the way to having a word from God for the king. But from there, we find that the next thing that we know of him is God says, now I want you to go and hide. I want you to go to the, to the east, really, to enemy it goes on to say um, um, in that, that he would really go to the mountains to a place uh, where the brook Cherith would flow into the Jordan. So up into the mountains there where the stream would come by, he says, get away from here. And it says, and it will be that you shall drink from the brook as I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. I, I guess if it were me, if I were Elijah, I would have been excited that God had a call on my life. I remember how excited I was when I finally surrendered that God would actually want to use me in ministry. To proclaim, thus saith the Lord, that this is God's word and he wanted me to preach the word. I, I was excited about it. Never wanted to be a preacher before, but, I, but I, I was honored that God would call me into the ministry. And, and to think that Elijah thought, this is, this is what God has for me, but then the very next thing He's by himself. He's by himself. I have heard it said, and I truly believe that the greatest work of God that he's going to do in your life is in your quiet time. The greatest work of God is when it's going to be with you and him alone. You're going to have some times that there are going to be some things that are on your heart that you're not going to feel like you can share with anybody else. You're not going to, if you did share it with them, they probably would call you a fool or, or, or crazy or why would you think that? And people would try to probably even talk you out of some things that might be dangerous things. But there's some things that once you know the voice of God, it may come 
even like a still, small voice, but you know his voice. The sheep know the voice of their shepherd. I just want to pause right now, and I want you to think. There may be some things that, that, that God's going to amen in your heart right now that he's been whispering in your ear, aiming towards your heart, aiming towards your feet. Some things that he's put some thoughts there, and he's waiting to see that if you're going to take those things and live them and obey those things, and if you're willing to act them out in your life. I guess if I had been Elijah, I might have had a little bit of an argument with God. You want me to go there, by myself there, alone? You want me to drink from the brook? I got that. It's going to be a drought, so you're going to provide water. But I'm going to be fed by the ravens? You're sending me there to hide? I don't know about all the men here, but... Most of us men wouldn't really prefer that, would we? We've been called into action. We're ready to go. But after you say yes to go into action, the first thing that he does is he puts you in inaction. Listen to me. God knows what he's doing. And though you may not understand it, and though you may understand that there may be some dry times in your life, some quiet times in your life, some times when you want to go, but he is saying, go slow, just to understand that your obedience then is ex extremely important. Because if you cannot be obedient in the small things, how can God trust you for the large things? I will tell you, in the early parts of my ministry, I was like the bull in the china shop. Not that I'm not now, but even more so then. And I, I, things were very black and white to me, and I thought, if this is what needs to be done, then do it with all your heart. And I probably did not lead very well. There were probably some battles that I took on that I probably should not have taken on. And there were some times that God needed to slow me down and let me be quiet. I remember going to a conference where... Uh, David Yogi Cho from Korea, who would spend three, four, five hours every morning in prayer. And I was introduced to spending much time with God in prayer. Led the church to 24-hour prayers. Had people coming. But, but listen, I'm not saying anything other than God was teaching me principles there that have walked with me for the remainder of my ministry. And God had to slow me down to, to teach me some things there. David had to begin in the pasture before he could ever be the king, the soldier, the giant killer, the leader of an entire nation. There may be some times that you want to overlook your quiet time, but that may be the time when God will shout to your soul. And Elijah said yes. I don't know that anybody could understand this. And it shall be that you shall drink from the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. Now, I don't care what the liberals say when they try to explain away God words, God's word. I believe that means exactly what it says it does. So verse 5 says, So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. That's a wonderful statement. Did what was... Uh, did according to the word of the Lord. For he went and stayed by the brook Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. That's better than Uber Eats right there. Who could come up with such a plan? I couldn't even dream up a prayer like that. God, I'm going to do your will, and I'm going to go and stay at this brook. And uh, by the way, Lord, send a bird by every morning with some meat, and some bread. I wonder if he went to Jezebel's house to get it. What do you think? <laughs> Amen? But the God who leads our life, the God who speaks to our soul, 
the God who holds our destiny, the God who has the keys to the kingdom of heaven, is the commander of the world today. And though you may see things as impossibilities, it is no big deal for God to feed us any way that he so chooses. He is Jehovah Jireh, the God who can provide. And if he wants to bring it on the wings of a bird, amen, hallelujah, praise be unto him. And if you can't live with that, if you can't understand that, and if you don't want to agree with that, you're the one at deficit. I wonder what it did for the growing man of God when every day he saw the bird bring the bread and the meat. Yes, Lord. You think he prayed over his food? Thank you, Lord. Do you think he understood in those genesis of days in his ministry, that God can do all things. My God shall supply all your needs according to his glory in Christ Jesus. We love that verse, don't we? But I wonder if we're willing to open up our hearts to the experience of it becoming real and alive in our life. Whether debating over where the next bill will be paid, whether if this sickness is unto death, if this is God's will. We've been, we've been praying over a name that, that God wants us to minister to. Is that really real? Does God really want us to do that? God did a ministry in his life. But in verse 7 it says, And it happened after a while that the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. I wonder what he's thinking then. What do you do when you're in the place that God sent you and your brook dries up? Abraham heard the call of God on his life to, to leave the Ur of the Chaldees, to follow God by his spirit, to take the journey that he had never been before, once again, allowing God to be his provision. Allowing God to be his road map. God is able to get you from where you are to where he wants you to be. But as soon as he got to the promised land, there was a drought. And Abraham, who knew so much, decided to go take matters into his own hand and went down to Egypt. Let, let, let's not preach that message there. Let's just give the invitation. Did he mess up? Boy, all right, hold on, let me try. I'm going to back up and we're going to try that again. Here I come again. Did he mess up? Yes. yes, he messed up. Did he get caught in lies? Yes. Did it almost cost him his wife? God's going to make of him a mighty nation, but he almost lost his wife in the process. How stupid we really are when we... When, when, when it, things don't happen exactly the way we think it is, what think it should be, why is it that we take matters into our own hand? Am I only talking to the men? Well, praise God for verse 8. Y'all look down at verse 8. Look up on the screen at verse 8. Look what it says. At the right time, then the word of the Lord came to him. You think God's got a further word? Once again, I just want you to pause and listen to the Holy Spirit. You've been faithful to the first word. Amen? Are you ready for the next word? Well, arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon. Jezebel's family, pagan Gentiles. Uh-oh. And dwell there. You want me to go where? See, I have commanded. I have commanded. You don't understand. I've already got this plan for you. The word's already out. I've commanded a widow there to provide for you. A widow? In that society, those were the ones in need. 
I wonder how he felt as a man when not just a woman, a single woman with no source of income, she's going to take care of you. Come on. It's the pride about here now. I'm a control freak, recovering control freak. I'm trying my best. Amen? But there's something that would come into me and say, no, no, no. I'm supposed to provide for my family. And I do the best that I can. But you're going to tell me that someone else is going to have to provide for me? Take care of me? Well, yeah, I got a widow. If it were Brian, I'd be going, Lord, what did you say? He said, he arose and went. Praise God, he had learned one thing on mission number one, that God will provide. It's not going to do any good to argue with the Almighty God. So he got up and went to the pagan land where the king's wife was from. The queen's, uh, excuse me, the queen's, yeah, the queen's father was the king of the land. Well, arise, go to Seraphath. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, indeed a widow was there gathering sticks. Could this be God? Well, he called to her and said, Please bring me a little water and a cup that I may drink. In a drought, what's the number one thing that you want? What's he asking for right off the bat? The biggest commodity they had. And trust me, a cup of cold water still a lot in a drought. He's putting out his Gideon fleece, really. He is seeing, is this God? Please, please bring me a little water and a cup that I may drink. And she was going to get it. He called her and said, uh, please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. I have often said that if I did not understand the end of this story, I would think he was a jerk. Hey, woman. Bring me some water. By the way, uh, bring me some fresh bread. So she said, as the Lord your God lives, she knew who he was. God had opened up this door already. I do not have bread. Only a handful of flour in a bin. And a little oil in a jar. And see, I am gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. All right, man, what you going to say at that point? I am so sorry. Ma'am, please forgive me. God must have somebody else prepared for me. Talk about an imposition. There was something that God was teaching this prophet. God wanted to change the land. But be listen to me. But before God was going to do the work of changing the land, he had to change the heart of a man. There is a way that seems right unto a man, but the way in thereof are the ways of death. I guarantee you, in Elijah's heart, this did not seem right. But you have to obey. Elijah said to her in verse 13, do not fear. The one thing that's going to keep us from being a useful vessel in the master's hands is fear. I spoke on it this morning. Fear is a liar. Fear is being afraid of the possibility of what could happen. But we have the assuredness of a God who will take care of us no matter what. So if we have a great big God, why are we so afraid of a little bitty thing? 
That's a pretty good question. Well, Elijah said to her, do not fear. Go and do as, I, as you have said, but make me a small cake from it first and bring it to me. Once again, I'd have called him a jerk if I didn't know what God was doing there. And afterwards, make some for yourself and your son. Then he gives the why. Verse 14, for thus says the Lord God of Israel, the bin of flour shall not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the earth. Elijah has come to the point in time and now in his life where he says, this is where I am. This is the circumstance that I am. This is what God is doing in my life. I just trust that God means what he says, and I can believe it and act upon it. So when he says to us, go ye therefore and make disciples, I guess that's what we need to be doing. In our circumstances, in your circle of influence, at New Holland, in Gainesville, at this time, Broadus said in Deacon's meeting, we need to be number one on our priorities. We need to make it a priority. We normally do what is our priority to do. I just wonder if this is on the list or if this is a priority. Well, verse 15, so she went away and did according to the word of Elijah. And she and he and her household ate for many days. Uh, let me just go on. The bin of flour was not used up, nor did the jar of oil run dry according to the word of the Lord which he had spoken by Elijah. It's interesting to me. Those, you, got, you got Moses and Elijah. Moses ate the manna. Elijah ate the bread of a widow. Both were from the hand of the most unexpected source, but God provided God provided. And the oil in the, in the Scripture is always a representation of the Spirit of God. We never run out of the supply of the Spirit of the living God. Well, he's learned his lesson, right? Oh, no. Look in verse 17. Now, it happened after these things that the son of the woman who owned the house became sick. And his sickness was so serious that there was no breath left in him. So she said to Elijah, what have I to do with you, O man of God? Now, she's not there yet. Let's see if Elijah's there yet. Have you come to me to bring my sin to remembrance and to kill my son? He said to her, give me your son. So he took her out of her arms and carried him to the upper room where he was stayed and later laid him on his bed, on his own bed. Now before, he only acted when God spoke. Church, listen to me. Now he's acting on his words. God has already spoke. Y'all good with that? This is not everything God knows, but it's our, it's our road map. It's everything he has for us to know. And every day as we open this up, we get an opportunity. Praise God for an opportunity. We have an opportunity to say yes, or we have an opportunity to say no. We have an opportunity to find more of God and less of us, or we'll find more of us and less of God. We're going to have an opportunity to do or we're going to have an opportunity to be destined for nothing. So now, God's waiting on him. God is commanded, but now he's waiting on a little fire of prayer. You listening, church? A fire of prayer. I believe this next statement with all my heart. Our God is sovereign. He is Lord of all. He needs nothing else in all the world to complete him. He is perfect. He is total. He can do whatsoever he so chooses. But there are times that God will limit himself. I don't limit him. Please get me. I don't limit him. I could not limit him. But God can limit himself. 
He puts an if-then into the situation. 2 Chronicles seven fourteen, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked way, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and heal their land. It's an if-then. I believe that God can do whatsoever he chose to do, chooses to do. But God chooses to work through the prayers of his people. He calls us to prayer. Jesus demonstrated a life of prayer. He was the son of God. He lacked nothing. But he went to be in communion with God. I'll take the point one step further. The Mount of Transfiguration, there was ministry that was going on there. The author from the foundations of the world who had put the plan in place still needed to be encouraged in the path because he was human now as well. Now we see Elijah coming in, and now we see, all right, God is put him there. He sent him to the widow. God has provided for him there, but something has come up, and he wants to know what Elijah is going to do with it. So Elijah took the boy and, and, and took him to his room. Verse number 20, then he cried out to the Lord and said, Oh, Lord, my God. I believe it's good to begin right there. Let's just make a statement of faith right here. You are my Lord. You are my master. I bow before no other. You are my God. Have you also brought tragedy on the widow with whom I lodged by killing her son? And he stretched himself out on the child three times. Now, I don't believe there's any healing in this. I don't believe that he's trying to, to, to do something in himself to cure. I think he is prostrating himself there. He is being involved in this, and he's crying out to the God, Oh, Lord, my God, I pray, let this child's soul come back to him. Much has been said about how he prayed three times. When Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he went off to pray. He went off three times. Lord, if there's any way this cup can pass for me, nevertheless, not my will, thy will be done. Three times. You think there was some urgency in his voice? Time is slipping by. Death looks like it is setting in. Urgency is there. I pray for prayers filled with tears. I pray for prayers that come from a soul overflow with urgency. It matters to God, but does it matter to us? Jesus came to die for sinners because he loves and he cares. He cried for the souls of those people. You've heard it sung, you've heard it said, while he was on the cross, we were on his mind. Not just me and you, but everyone that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I wonder how much urgency is within us. I guess that's the definition the priority brought us. The higher the priority, the higher the urgency. Do you think that he had grown attached to this family? A child without a father? Maybe he even became somewhat of a father figure. I don't know. But he cries out. And praise God for verse 22. Then the Lord heard the voice of Elijah. When God hears, 
God's not slow to speak. And the soul of the child came back to him. And he revived. That is the exact same word I pray for the church. Revived. Come back to life. Be triumphant. I'll be honest, there's some places in my own spirit that I need revival. I'm not there. There's strongholds in my life that I want to see God conquer. I want to never be controlled by fear. I never want to be quiet because of the fear of rejection. I want to speak the name of Jesus. I want to do it in love and not in Brian's name. I want to do it for his glory and not for New Holland's. We may build a new building here and put on the cornerstone out there, but I pray that everything that is done will be done and built on the foundation of Jesus Christ and Him alone. We get the opportunity, the opportunity, I say to you, the opportunity to change heaven today. We need to make sure that more, more people get there and less people spend their eternity separated from a holy God. God was waiting to see if it meant as much to Elijah as it did to the widow and as it did to the Father, the Heavenly Father. And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper room into the house, and Elijah gave him to the mother. And Elijah said, <laughs> Hey, see, your son lives. You know what I think he's saying? We've got a good, good father. We serve a great big God. Do you think that he believed that God had done great and mighty things in the lives of others? Sure. Do you think God did great and mighty things through Jesus? Do you think God did great and mighty things through the prophets? Through the apostles? And all the people down generation after generation, century after century. Literally, we can say now, millennium after millennium. Do you think God is able to continue a work? Do you believe God is still able to speak and to save souls? Do you believe God is willing to change something in us so he can change something in the world? I need it. I think you may too. Sometimes we need a little encouragement. Sometimes we need to remember. We need it right here in front of us to say, yes, Lord, yes, I believe. Even if we follow it with a help thou my unbelief, I still think we know our God can. My God can. Verse 24, and the woman said to Elijah, now by this, I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord is in your mouth. The word of the Lord in your mouth is the truth. That's what this community needs. There needs to be such a revival in us that the words that we speak, they will believe. I had a church member not too long ago been inviting people to church, and they said, Pastor, I keep inviting, and I keep inviting, and they're not coming. Well, obviously, all I tried to do was encourage him. But church, God knows exactly what he's doing. God sent Elijah to a brook in a drought where he would be fed by ravens. I believe when he learned that lesson, he sent him to a widow where his pride would have to be down here. But God did a work not only in Elijah, he did a work in that woman's life. And then, so I believe the whole community would know. He allowed something to happen to that son, but he had already seen what he was going to do. 
And now she is testifying. You see, there's some things that we're all going to have to go through. And I'm not praying that those things go away. There's some difficulties I'm afraid that they're going to have to happen. And I, I, I can't pray that they go away. I know we pray for the sick list. But I tell you more than anything, I, would, I just want God's will to be done. And I'm not going to pray against God's will. I'm going to pray that God's will be done in my life. God's will be done in your life. What a mighty God we serve. When we get to the next chapter, something's going to happen that would have never happened if chapter 17 hadn't been there. Are you good that there have been some things that have happened in your life that have gotten you to a place where the fire can fall from heaven? I pray so. I pray in my life. I pray so. I pray that for Mark's life, in Janice's life, in Phil's life, Cheryl, even in your life. You and Pater dancing in church back there. Joy of the Lord overflowing. I love it. And Gary's life. Cheryl's life. Kay's life. Joe's life. Pat's life. Vaughn's life. Melba's life. She's inviting people. And she came this morning. Somebody in need. Somebody hurting. Isn't that what we're supposed to be doing? Let the church be the church. Let the people rejoice. For we've settled the question and we've made our choice. So let's let the anthems ring out and songs of victory swell. For the church triumphant, Alive and well. Let's pray. Oh God, may your church be your church. I am grateful, oh God, that you can do great and mighty things. And I pray, Lord, that in the next few moments that you will speak to our spirits. Father, I pray for words of encouragement for you, words of strength, Father, I also pray that words of direction where it's needed, maybe even, Lord, words of nevertheless not my will, but thy will be done, if that applies. I pray for all the ones that you've put on our heart. I pray that in the weeks and the months ahead, we will start to see them come one at a time into a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Father, prepare us before the fire can fall. Let it begin in us. Father, speak to us personally during this time. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.